Hey everyone, it's Jason Coleman again with Paid Memberships Pro. And uh, on the podcast today, I have a special guest, Chris Teitzel, who is the founder and CEO of Locker.io and Seller Door and all around uh, web security expert. Um, so I thought we'd just get him in here to chat a bit about uh, security with respect to WordPress, membership sites, development in general, trade some more stories. <laughs> All Try not to break stuff. NDAs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, thanks for having me on. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, so maybe just like a softball to get into it is yeah. to talk about WordPress security in general. I think sometimes WordPress gets a bad rap and it is one of the, um, some of our customers who are moving from another platform to WordPress is one of their concerns. They hear that WordPress is insecure and then we right. have to kind of talk them out of that, uh, that notion. And uh, right. how, how do you go about answering that question when people put it to you that way? Yeah, no, it's it's funny because I actually uh, for the for the early part of my career uh, was solely doing Drupal work, right? And so mm. uh, to us, there was always this you know Drupal versus WordPress, Ford versus Chevy thing going on, where everyone you know had their preference and and uh, would would try to downplay the other. And the number one thing I always heard in Drupal is like, oh, don't use WordPress; it's not secure. And so I always mm -hmm. thought like, yeah, it's, it's probably less secure. There's, there's issues with it. And you hear about all these breaches and stuff. The number one thing that all those breaches come from are all the plugins and themes. They're not from core, right? Like a, an yeah. open source, this is kind of the myth of open source versus closed source uh, and proprietary is that for some reason, open source is less secure. Um, and it's just that their dirty laundry is just in the public, right? Yeah, so exactly. you see yeah. that more often, um, having been in worked with enterprises and such, I can tell you there's just as many security issues happening behind the scenes. They're just caught and handled internally uh, behind NDAs and everything else so that the, they're not publicly shown. Uh, but it, it's, it's yeah. happening across the across the gamut of, of uh, applications and such. So, yeah, WordPress isn't any less secure. You just have to go about it um, in, a, in a more thoughtful way, right? Because one of the things, the benefit of WordPress is that there's so many plugins out there, right? There's so many themes yeah. you can do so much. But then you have to think every time I'm taking that person's theme or that code and putting it in my site, I'm essentially letting them do and operate within my my website, right? And so make sure that you're you're yeah. vetting the plugins and themes that you're using. Um, and themes in general can be way overpowered um, mm -hmm. because you can put so much functionality into a WordPress theme uh, that they they act kind of like a quasi plugin. Um, yeah. So I, I have mad respect for for it's themes kinda, that say no, we're going to split this into a plugin and a theme. It's like okay, you get it. Like separate the duties type. Of yeah, thing. whenever possible, try to like choose the plugin or theme that does exactly what you need and doesn't have extra baggage. Yeah, um, totally. Or if you're using a plugin anymore, uninstall it. That kind of thing. Like keep your one hundred percent as possible. Oh yeah, um, no. There's there's tons yeah. of folks that keep just all their plugins installed, enabled. Um, I was on a uh, helping out with a site recently that. I asked them, I was like, what's this plugin for? They're like, oh, we haven't used that in four years. And I was like, why is it turned on? Like, why is it still there? Yeah, it hasn't it. been updated, right? And so now you've got all the security issues that are likely with it. So um, yeah, it's it's a lot of that. And then it's also because of how wide and how big the WordPress base is, um, mm. you you have just an inherent, you know, right. larger it's like a Windows versus Mac from. thing. Like, totally, people it, are like, oh, you can never hack a Mac. Yeah. It's like, no, you can. It's just the broader base of businesses in Windows, so that's where everyone's going after, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so WordPress I, is like forty percent of the internet, you know, is running on WordPress now, so it's a big target of these yeah. automated scripts. Just try to yeah. they just roll through in. and they they try. We actually see on the Drupal side, we see a lot of Drupal. Our Drupal sites are getting crawled as if they're WordPress sites because these these bots yeah. are out there thinking, okay, yeah. if it's WordPress, Our, let me just go try it, right? Our license server, which doesn't run WordPress, it's a custom PHP script, like got shut down because people were hitting, they were looking for, you know, WP admin. Yep. <laughs> yep. I was like, that's the irony. It's like, this is like, we're a WordPress company, but this is like the one thing that's not WordPress, but they just right. hit it so often that it, <laughs> you know, overloaded the server and we had to like update yep. some of that security. Yep. Yeah. Um, and speaking of servers, uh, the other thing is there's a, um, a base of WordPress sites that are all done on you know, cheap VPSs that you're you're paying a couple bucks and, and popping up a server and putting a, a site on it because, you know, it's cheap and easy. I want to create a blog for my cat or something like that, right? Like something super easy, yeah. something something not critical. Well, that server, if it's not taken care of, then it can get hacked and then people just pivot from there and, and use that, those resources, right? So um, 
not inherently saying that the five dollar hosts are insecure, right. but you have this broader base of sites that have less security around them. Yeah, if you're running your own, like maybe like we could share some stories that will simultaneously scare people, but also make them feel good about like the response. <laughs> like one time, um, and it, it kind of goes towards like us as a plugin company, what we're doing to protect customers and then the hosts, what they're doing uh, to protect customers. Cause some of that, you know, maybe isn't seen that um, these hosts, when they see exploits in the wild, they run, you know, scripts at like the firewall level that right. will stop the vulnerability before like the plugin has even had a chance to update like what they, yep. um, like what was broken. We had a really like, the, all right, this is like, I don't know if I ever shared this on video, but the, the worst exploit that paid members pro ever had was over five years ago. But um, we have a feature to lock down files. So if you want to, you know, you upload pictures to the WP content folder, yep. uh, built into Paid Managers Pro, you can lock down the post, but the actual JPEG is stored on the server. And if someone right. figures out how to navigate to that URL, your web host is just going to, you know, serve the image and people yep. will be able to get to your, your files or your videos that you're trying to protect. So we built this script. It was called like the get file script. And it would, when you would load an image, it would run through the PHP script, check if you're a member. And if you're a member, then give you the file. If you're yep. not, kick you out. Now that's like a really sensitive thing. And we spent a lot of time trying to like lock down the security on it. Um, because if if we have a script that's taking like a URL to a file and then serving it to the user, like we want to like, hey, this is actually, you know, not other files outside of WordPress and stuff like right. that. Or if you're um, running a multi-site, this isn't somebody else's file, right? Like you got to make sure, yeah. especially, yeah. yeah. So, but what's interesting is like, like our own security practices, like, you know, th th this is like an, a case where like the hackers are like super clever. So you could think like, if you put like dot, dot slash in the URL, it's going to look yep. up one directory. So we knew about that. And we like said, Hey, filter out dot, dot. If you have dot, dot slash, you're doing something mischievous. Like that's right. not the use case for this block it. But what people did was they put dot, instead of putting dot, dot slash, they put dot a bunch of other characters that would get flagged as insecure and get sanitized out of the string. Yep. And in the end, it would be left with, left with dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, yep. slash rather. So it's kind yep. of our own like sanitization of the URL would strip out like this, these malicious characters. And then it'd be left with dot, dot, slash. But after we had checked, you know, for the dot, dot, slash, and it's like, oh, I never thought you could do that. So they figured out right. how to kind of bypass the security. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if anyone ever abused that in the wild, but like we got a heads up from a security team who found it. And like, here's, you know, they responsible yep. disclosure um, that we also like at that same time, web hosts, um, you know, we're putting those, like I said, those scripts, they say, Hey, we know what the URL looks like when right. people are trying to exploit, we, we stop out. it, you know? And in a day, yeah. you know, we put up a thing and we, we did all kinds, you know, we fixed that, but also like a bunch of security measures. It's not on by default. You, you know, it's, uh, yep. there's like a, a block list of extensions and things like that that aren't supported. Um, so anyway, we fixed it and we pushed it out and then we had like sent out a message to everyone to update. Um, and, but it was like, a, it was a whammy because if you exploited that, you could load, you know, WP config and, oh, you yeah. know, see what their database dat password was or any other file yep. or whatever. Um, yep. Yeah, but it's like everyone in the community fixed it really quick. You know, it's like yeah, and that's that's the beauty of open source, right? Is that um, it, it sucks when you when you have a, an exploit like that. You know, let let whoever has built perfect code, um, you know, <laughs> comment uh, about it. But it's like every code has bugs in it. Every code has security issues in it. There's no the only yeah. secure program is not connected to anything else, right? Like so, the the inherent nature of us building websites means that we're building something that's inherently insecure. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, having cross-site scripting errors or uh, privilege escalations like that, I've seen uh, a plugin that was trying to do um, some remote admin stuff where, you know, their service mm -hmm. could ping in uh, via an API and update. So you would update something in their website and it would change something in your plugin, right? Um, yeah. Cool feature. You know, again, these aren't maliciously done by open source uh, devs, but they, they thought that would be a cool feature. But what they didn't do was sanitize what was coming in. So all it was was a JSON payload that hit an API endpoint that said, set this option to this, set this option to this. And that yeah. JSON payload was just their JSON, right? But all you had to do is feed it a JSON that said, set you know, um, default role user role to admin and yep. set, you know, open up user registrations. And every user was an admin at that point, right? So um, there, there are steps like that where it's like just no... When you're when you're writing code or you're you're building an open source, just know where the kind of the sensitive areas are. And like you guys said, you knew 
Files are yeah. a sensitive thing. Being able to show files is a sensitive thing. Um, but then, yeah, you got to think like a hacker. And the fun thing about being a hacker is you get to just kind of go off and do your own thing and, and you know find out how something works and then try to make it do something it doesn't do. Uh, and if you can do that, then you've hacked it. And now you try to go make it do something nefarious, right? So, um, but the, the idea of responsible disclosure and the fact that you guys are working with security teams. Um, and once you get notified, you you um, you update it. Thanks to WordPress's um, latest system, you know you can make that a minor release. That will then roll in um, yeah. automatically to all the sites and stuff. Yeah, it's just one of those things where the, the pipeline now, if, if you can manage that pipeline, it's, it's so much better. Again, though, as hackers always do, they try to find new exploits. And the new exploits are really the, the pipelines, right? Like, how can you yeah. get your code into the pipeline and get it distributed? There's been folks in the WordPress yeah. plugin repository that have bought bought out a plugin, right? And then said, oh, I'm going to release some some malware and shove that in and make it auto update. Now, you know, 10,000 sites have that running on it, right? So um, you got you to gotta make sure that pipeline is there, but now you have to protect the pipeline. And, and that goes back yeah. to working with plugins that you know and trust. One exciting thing in the, um, like the WordPress.org plugin repository, uh, this coming out soon is they're building like an automated script similar to what they do for themes. Like this is kind mm -hmm. of in inside baseball for uh, WordPress developers. <laughs> if it's okay. Yeah. Um, but the, if you, if you submit a theme to the .org repository, there's a couple automated scripts that just search like really heavily for anything that looks like it could possibly be yeah. like not just security issues, but kind of like coding standard issues and things like that. Um, but on the plugin side, it's more of a manual process of review and they really rely yeah. on the plugin devs to do more themselves. Um, yep. but they're working on scripts that will flag things and be like, this looks like a little scary. You should double check it. Um, right. and that, that'll help folks, especially, you know, kind of, you know, newer de devs. Um, but also us, cause like, you know, every few months, like someone else catches a cross site scripting, uh, bug yeah. in the code that we have. And it's coming from pull requests of other people or us or just code we had. It's like, you know, 12 yep. years and it was in three subfolders in a file that, you know, was off our radar. And we're like, oh yeah, totally. but, you know, yeah. Yeah, and it's not that it's any yeah. better, um, but the the Drupal process has, was interesting. It was interesting submitting yeah. plugins to both repos because um, in Drupal you actually have to go through a vetting process to become able to post to Drupal.org. Um, so, okay. like WordPress.org, yeah. um, I want to say the vetting process was like three days or something like that. Three mm -hmm. or four days, they took a look at the plugin. They said, "Yep, you're good." Boom, plugins in the repo. Uh, for yeah. Drupal, it took months because not only do you have to submit your new plugin and say here's a plug or my module and here's the module that i would like to do um that module had to meet a certain level of criteria have a certain number of functions certain number of files you know certain amount of complexity so you couldn't just game the system um because yeah. what they do is they basically vet the gate and then once you're through the gate you can create as many modules as you want without anybody looking at them right um yeah but to get through that gate, you had to go through a security review and that security review had to be done by somebody else. And you got credit for reviewing other people's code so that you could get bumped uh, up okay. in the line. It was like all this stuff going yeah, back yeah. and forth. Uh, but once we finally got approved, we're in. And one of the cool things about that is the, the Drupal security team is then focused on Drupal.org's, all their, their plugin or all the modules there. And they're constantly scanning them um, and running automated tools against them and such which you know, WordPress is doing as well. Um, but I just thought it was interesting, like part of the reason this, that WordPress is so successful is the broad uh, ecosystem of plugins yeah. and themes around it where <laughs> Drupal, their whole um, um, ethos is different. It's like a few number of plugins or a few number of modules that can do a lot of things um, it, or a few number of, of uh, you know, the whole idea Companies of building them. four different- yeah. Almost certified. It's like, yeah, it's like, why would you have yeah. four? form plugins, you only need one. Where in WordPress, there's the ecosystem for that. There's the, the economics behind it so that you, if you make a better form plugin, go make a better form plugin, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, may, I mean, maybe it seems like, yeah, WordPress is doing more of that automated stuff. And I think in general, WordPress could use some like certification steps at points. Mm -hmm. um, and we might do it even in ourselves, just within our ecosystem of our membership plugin you know, a certain percentage of support cases that we're working on, it's because someone high, which is something we recommend, like, hey, you want to do that? We try to be customizable, yep. hire someone to do it. And then when I look at their code, I'm like, I wouldn't have done it that way. Right. <laughs> I was like, right. and that's why it's causing issues. And it's, um, it's like, oh, but how do we train developers in general, like the quote unquote, right way to do things, especially right. when it's a moving target? Um, right. 
Yeah, no, and there's yeah. you could you could do that for your ecosystem and say um, within our ecosystem, here's what we recommend to do, and here's the standards that we have um, in order to be you know quote unquote approved by us. Even though technically it's open source, yeah. anyone can do anything they want. Um, yeah, that's somewhat consider, yeah. what Drupal's done. Is it said, hey, you have to jump this bar. You have to go through some sort of review to make sure you know what you're doing before we just let you publish anything you want. Um, that's yeah. not to say that that you know Drupal modules are any more secure. They're not. We've had some massive, massive <laughs> breaches over on the Drupal side as well. So um, yeah. it's it's a it's an entire ecosystem thing. But it's just a matter of like how do you go after it and and how do you get after it. So, so something kind of related to security is like on the privacy side. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, well, like I, I highlighted a tweet of, of yours um, where I think this was the wording. Let me look at it again. Um, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to load on Twitter. I don't trust how I copied it. <laughs> Um, you said here, like, uh, all too often privacy and security are seen as hindrance to innovation. And all too often I get asked about it as part of the cleanup process and not the design, yeah. um, which, which is really important. So it's like security and privacy, like right. how do we make it part of the design of these features instead of kind of like we said, like, oops, I, I put a bug and someone caught it for me and now I can fix it, you know? Right. Um, yeah. what kind of things should we think about in advance? So it goes back to like in... In security, on the security side of things, and while security and privacy are, are heavily linked, um, they also have uh, their own intricacies. The On the security side of things, I, I find myself, um, it's a hygiene thing. Just like every day you wake up, you know, you take a shower, you brush your teeth, you do everything you need to do uh, for personal hygiene, there's a coding hygiene. And the more you get yeah. into that, um, the more you get into that cadence as a developer, the better off you'll be. So as you're developing, always think about like you guys did um, with the file plugin. It, it's like, how can this be exploited, right? In the in the ideation stage, right? At the beginning of it, how can this be used wrong? And if you can think like a hacker then, then you're not fighting the yeah. hackers after it's, after it's launched, right? Same thing with privacy. Um, all too often, folks will collect a bunch of data or do a bunch of stuff and then afterwards be like, oh, probably shouldn't have collected all that data or probably shouldn't have you know, ask for that information yeah. or now we have to deal with this, you know, this regulation or that regulation or something else. Um, and by that time, the lawyers are getting involved and, you know, all too often I see lawyers getting pulled into at the end of the process saying, hey, can you review this for privacy concerns or can you review this for um, security concerns or if you're doing a security scan on a, on a plugin, when in reality that, that process should have happened. You should have seen the design. Yeah, totally. And if you if you bring the lawyers in, the lawyers aren't bad people. Like uh, tech and yeah. tech and lawyers um, are almost like des developers and designers. Like for whatever reason, there's an animosity there at times that that just shouldn't be. But yeah, and if there's you an bring understanding the in early that yeah. you can solve a lot of the problems. Yeah, and uh, like even like the GDPR as like a a law that's um, being applied to privacy practices. Um, there's like wiggle room in there. Like it's not black and white. Like I know um, right. you know some people say. Oh, like just like if someone leaves their account, like delete all their data, shut close. And you'd be like, no, nah, actually, I don't want to delete all their data. Like, you know, I took money from them. I have to be able to keep track of that for taxes right. and accounting and all that stuff. And like, yep. it makes sense to have this amount of information. And if you read the headlines, it's like, oh, you have to be able to delete everything when they leave. And it's like, no, like you have to be able to, I forget the wording now, I'm going to butcher it. But it's like, you know, you're allowed to keep the data that's like required for business operations and stuff like that. And yep. um, for, for tax and, and business it, operations, you definitely keep yeah. that data around. Um, we actually are working on a, a product right now um, that are, is aimed specifically at at that right to be forgotten um, and, and yeah. right to deletion around uh, crypto shredding. So being able mm. to say, hey, I encrypted all that data with this key. So if I delete the key, I've essentially deleted the data and it's just an easy way of doing that. Um, okay. Because yeah, there's, huh, there's so yeah. much wiggle room. There's so oh, much, cool. there's so much um, uh, leeway that a lot of folks are just like, I don't know how to do this. And so our, our whole goal with our company is to try to make these like esoteric or, yeah. or larger security issues relatable, right? We call it democratizing yeah. security, but it's like, how do we make it so that, you know, a basic site developer or site builder can can utilize the tools and techniques that larger enterprises are already doing, and and can we can we scale that down, and then can we yeah. on that scale down scale that part up? I, I remember one time years ago, like Facebook. I mean, this has happened the same kind of story a number of times. But at the time, Facebook was getting crap because 
when they deleted user data, like the, it turned out like the user wasn't really delete, deleted. It was in a database right. somewhere. And I was like, no, I don't, I, yeah, I was like, it's got some company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if you know how, if you know how internet apps are built, like you're not surprised. I was like, I was running like the wine, wine log database at the time. And I'm yeah. like, our little website, like every day we make a backup and push it to AWS. And when you ask me to delete, I'm not going to go back and open, yep. you know, the 35 gigabyte backup files I have yep. and like remove your name from them. But that crypto yep. sh- shredding is like pretty cool. That's a way to do that. Yeah, it's kind that, of like, that's I what it's key. made for is that it actually yeah, that's allows awesome. you to delete in your backups without ever touching your backups. Because right now yeah. you talk to most folks about what do they do and they say, oh, when I bring the database back, I just... Um, I just run this script and it sanitizes it. And it's like, great. Well, a hacker is not going to run yeah. your sanitizing script. They're just going to take all the data and walk, right? Right. So, but but laws are purposely oh, yeah. made that yeah. that broad, right? They're they're purposely yeah. made to be that way. Um, partly because uh, it takes so long to get them in place that you you want to write them broad. But in in the EU versus the US, it's also different because the EU um is has more of a mentality of we'll work with businesses on this to make this okay. law uh, yeah. apply we're in the us it's like we're going to write this really broad and then we're going to let the courts decide how to interpret mm-hmm. what we just wrote right and so they wait for the litigation yeah. to occur um and so like with ccpa and everything else everyone's just kind of waiting all right what's the first major litigation that's going to set the bar for what this really means we see what it means in 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 words but that's how does it work in practice right california consumer protection Yep. something yep. Okay. yep the california consumer protection act it's it's a yeah. uh the gdpr of of yeah. basically the u.s now because all internet at some point yeah california's leading yeah they have a lot so of yeah so a lot users. of the innovation that we're seeing now um in privacy and insecurity are around trying to solve these issues of yeah. um regulations aren't aren't slowing down they're increasing and so how can we you know stay ahead of that and then how can we work with developers um you know, like you guys and say, um, you know, you're, you're building a, a product in a, um, in a community. How do you keep that safe? How do you keep that product yeah. there? You guys are focusing on, you know, building the best membership sites you can. Um, you're staying as much as you can in tune with all the privacy regulations, but you're not a privacy lawyer. Yeah. You're not doing any of that. Yeah. Uh, so then how can you, how can you bring that innovation in? Um, and really it is, is like every time you design something new, you're doing what you're doing now. You're talking to yeah. security experts and you're saying, how do we do this better? How do we, you know, what can we yeah. do to make our process better? What One part of that that helps, I think, um, is that when we're developing features, we often take the end user's perspective, even though like mm-hmm. our customer is a business that sits in between. Right. Um, so I'm trying to think of a good example, but oftentimes like, you know, um, there are shady businesses that would want to take advantage of their customers. So like, you know, yeah. one, one case is kind of, um, you know, when, you, you know, people are setting up a subscription to build their credit card every month. And there really is a class of business owner that's like, oh, don't remind them. That would be great if they forgot that they owe me right. every month. And I just billed them an extra time and got their money. Right. Right. Um, and, and it, us, we're like, now, like we, we take a stance. We're building it from the end user's perspective. Like, hey, by default, it's going to send an email because that's what the customer would want. By default, right. it's going to protect their privacy on this information because that's what the customer would want. And it's it's open source customizable code. So if you're, you know, you want to do things like a little shady or maybe you just like that's too strict. You have your own way of kind of protecting things. You can yep. override it. But we try to make the defaults customer friendly. And I think just like it, the laws like keep changing and it's moving and sometimes it's hard to figure out like exactly what you have to do. But if you just always keep the end user in mind and do what's best for them based on what you, you know, stay educated, do what's best for them in your mind, you you get 90% of the way there. And then yeah. when the laws solidify, you, you you have to spend a few weeks kind of like coding things. <laughs> and a lot <laughs> of the law, right. uh, yeah. you know, GDPR is a great example. Um, intent is part of the law. Like if you as a yeah. developer in t- are intending to do well and you end up doing something wrong, you're not punished as hard as somebody who is intentionally doing wrong. Right, um, and they yeah. they they understand that, right? And so that's where in GDPR the disclosures and all that occur. But you guys are taking mm-hmm. the the yeah. perfect a- approach to that is, um, you know, looking at. I go back to I'm a I'm a comic book nerd and stuff. Is you know, with great power comes great responsibility. It's like you have this power that you're building a tool that is building out all these websites, and with that comes the responsibility of can we build that tool to be better for the other people um, on the other end of this, right? And so. Yeah. Um, I think all too often um, we as as developers and innovators and entrepreneurs 
just try to chase the the next best thing. Like, how can we go build something fun? Because that's what that's what you know yeah. gives us energy and, and keeps us going. But at the same time, we also have to pause and say, how is this going to be used? How could it be used wrong? How can we do it differently? Uh, and where can we go from here? And and being able to um, to have those conversations early on are great. We have those conversations within our company if we're building something. Is how can this be abused? If we were to if we were yeah. to launch this now, how would you know somebody with um, an extremist point of view or uh, is out to do harm? How would they misuse this? And then how can we prevent that or or try to circumvent that from happening? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's I guess it's just kind of that the there, there's a balance there, but all too often yeah. I hear folks say innovation and privacy and security are at odds with each other, um, yeah. and they don't have to be. They actually innovation in privacy and security um, is incredibly lucrative right now, as you know, cybersecurity is not a a shrinking business, and so um, for anybody who's building products, who's building services, who's building websites. Um, you know, if you're an agency, if you're a freelancer or whatever, adding security to what you do um, yeah. will make you it's more a, profitable in the end. And you're yeah, building a, a better web. It's a competitive advantage and, yeah. um, you know, something that, yep, you can leverage. Yeah. Um, I guess towards that point of like uh, innovation and what's in store for the future. Yeah. Um, like what's on, on your radar? I'm definitely going to look into this like crypto shredding thing. That's cool. Has that been around yeah. for like ever? <laughs> and the, it's like the it's concept just, of crypto really shredding new. is is not new. And that's yeah. that's what's fun yeah. about the product for us is like yeah. we don't have to go out and say, hey, we're doing something completely different and new. And here's why it works. It's we're yeah. just productizing a process that's been around for decades. Right. The idea of yeah. uh, of crypto shredding is actually how when you uh, log in to um, find my iPhone and you say, hey, wipe my iPhone, I, it got stolen. Uh, okay, yeah. What you're yeah. doing is you're sending a kill switch the to key. the the key holder that or the the uh, encryption method inside the phone to say, delete the key. And once you've deleted yeah. the key, everything on the device is gone, right? It doesn't You'll actually never get delete it on the phone. Yep, yep. yeah. yeah. So cool. the, the stat I always so, like to say is that it, it takes more energy than the sun has ever produced, put into the largest supercomputer that we have known to man for as long right. as the universe has been around to guess half of the amount of keys that it could be for most of the encryption keys. So no one's ever gonna just like, you know, you know, CSI style sit in front of this crazy computer and hack your key. That doesn't that doesn't happen. People find yeah. it. Right. And so um if you can if you can shred that key when you want to, um, then you're good. The other side from <laughs> from managing keys and stuff for folks, I can tell you a lot of the times we, people delete keys that they don't want deleted. And so yeah, we've, we've um, with what we do is we actually build in some redundancies that allow someone to say a couple days later, like, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to delete that. Let's let's pull that back and not permanently, permanently lose their data. It's kind of a, a sliding scale, right? Um, yeah. Because again, if you go that route and you're encrypting things, that's great. You're super secure. But the moment you lose that key, your data is gone. Like it's, it's never recoverable, right? That's like all the Bitcoin yeah. hard drives yeah. that sit out like, there that have, say, have ever no since you, can, you can yeah. manage your own keys and you're like, I don't know, man. Like I've definitely, I, I, maybe I trust uh, like a, a bank or a company yeah. like Coinbase with my keys more than myself because right. my kids are like <laughs> opening my iPad and clicking random buttons and stuff. Right. <laughs> and like, right. you know, yeah. Ask the guy in London or in uh, England who's got the, I think it's up to like 250, 300 million dollar hard drive that's sitting oh, yeah. in a, uh, uh, yeah, in a, you know, a dump somewhere because he he didn't know what was on there. So <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, trying no, to get, get people to help him dig it up. Yeah, the more you do crypto stuff like that, but along the crypto lines, there's some really cool stuff that um, you know, yeah. blockchain is one of those um, it's one of those sensitive topics for me because there's a lot of like snake oil out there around yeah. like hey, crypto and blockchain. You you know, throw blockchain. My AI brothers, yeah, and machine learning. I, I want to write something, something up get, like yeah, yeah. I have this like internal process for like figuring out if like a new crypto thing is like legitimate or not. There's kind of like a four right. step. And I was like, oh, I realized I had this checklist. So my brother's like, what about this one? And I was like, that's a scam. And right. I was like, how do I know that's a scam? I was like, how do I expect people who don't read about this every day to know like right. the real stuff from the scam? It's, and a lot of it sounds scammy. <laughs> um, and, and but what's, honestly, what's not scammy and exciting? Security, yeah, most yeah. of security is about that, right? Like um, yeah. there's, there's jokes mm -hmm. even within the security industry of, it's like there are snake oil peddlers within the security industry who are out there selling fake security. And one of my favorite, um, there's a at RSA, which is like the big uh, conference for security every uh, year. Yeah. Um, there's a consulting group called Fake Security, and they publish. Uh, or one year they came dressed up as like um, cowboys, and they were actually had like a snake oil peddling 
uh, like a tincture of machine learning and just put this on there and everything will be fine, right? Like there's all oh, this yeah. FUD out there, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? That's what, what mm -hmm. folks sell on. And at the end of the day, they're doing nothing with it. Um, blockchain and um, the blockchain technology itself is actually very, very powerful. You can authorize yeah. and have broad consensus around something that occurred. Um, so when you start looking at, you know, taking it back to membership sites, say you're running a membership site for the American Pediatrics Association, you know, okay. you're going to publish out a new press release and you want everyone to know that this press release is from you. It is certified from you. No one else has touched it. Right. Um, yeah. you can certify that on the blockchain and you can put that on the blockchain and say, this has not been tampered with, this has not been, uh, altered, or here yeah. are all the alterations that, that have gone with it. Right. Um, and so there's, there's a wide variety. I think there's still a lot of shakedown that's going to occur in that, in that space and that technology. But I think eventually we'll start to see the yeah. more everyday uses of it in things like tickets, online sales, um, you know, uh, documents, legal documents, being yeah. being able to track how like your terms and conditions and your through. privacy policy. I exactly. saw some companies are publishing them on the blockchain because yep. I mean, technically, mine's just a WordPress page. I could go in and edit it, yep. and you know, there's I say, hey, this is what you, you do. That yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So how do, yeah. So how there's, you know what there's a lot of that going on. Um, yeah, and then um, you know, Solar Winds and and some of those hacks have brought up um, some some fairly big gaps that. Right now, even the brightest minds in security are sitting there going, I don't know if we have a good solution to this, right? Like a yeah, it was like a hardware attack. hack, right? Yeah, yeah. well, uh, it was a supply no. chain attack. Uh, it was oh, software. Right, okay, yeah, but I'm mixing up. Basically, yeah. everyone put all their trust into Solar Winds, and Solar Winds was built to identify all these systems, make sure and monitor them. And to do so, it said, oh, by the way, we have to have like God mode access to all these systems, right? But what yeah. happens when that God mode tool gets hacked? And it wasn't a direct hack on the tool. It was a supply yeah. chain attack that made its way into the developer pipeline that got through all the scanners and then got released out. And that's why it took six months for it to be found uh, was because folks were actually like, they were getting hacked and going, how are we getting hacked? And they they ended up you know, finding it yeah. that route. And so there's um, in terms of like what's new in security, um, you know, I, I think that a, there's gonna be a, a lot of focus in the years to come around um, those supply chain attacks and how, because things are so automated and things can ripple out so fast amongst the web, like even with the automated updates and, and plugins and stuff we, like that, like how can you make sure yeah. that that supply chain isn't tainted? Because then once it gets released, it's going everywhere. Yeah. Cause like with, um, with Gutenberg being added to WordPress and like tapping into like the node JS uh, ecosystem, mm -hmm. You know, our, uh, you know, the package manager loads a bunch of JavaScript dependencies that I have no idea about. And every once in a while, oh, yeah. GitHub will say, it looks like a security issue. GitHub tells me like, hey, you have to like upgrade this JavaScript dependency that you don't really know about. Yep. And yep. honestly, like, I mean, I'm just doing, I'm like, okay, I'm trusting them. I'm, I'm saying like, yeah, I'm swapping it. And right. um, I take a look sometimes, but it's often like, it's like, it, you can't really tell how like a, a one line change in a random JavaScript library is going to affect the block. And like, we're not even updating yeah. blocks kind of, a, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you kind of have to trust that like these thousands of JavaScript libraries that are being used by everyone else. And I, like, I put trust in WordPress who's using them too. And they put trust. Right. And that's kind of how that solar winds thing happens. Right. And so then the the bigger company is, that's supposed to be watching it. Right. Yeah. And what happens when that trust is broken, right. Or, or someone's able to yeah. manipulate that trust. Uh, I mean, you remember left pad, right. From the, uh, a few years back to hear about that. Within the what was left hand? Remind me. There was uh, uh, a JavaScript uh, uh, library. Oh yes, that yeah, yeah. That was the library and everything, yeah. and all it did was pad to the left, right? Like it just added yep. some padding um, within the code to the left. Well, if that went, the the owner of it got upset about some naming rights and pulled the plugin off of npm and essentially crashed every build pipeline uh, across the world yeah. because it was used in React and everything else. So yeah, there's this. Um, Node's a perfect example of it is like the ability to sneak something into the supply chain and then get it out um, is a is a big issue. And so, you know, folks are, are having to take a look at that. Fun, fun stuff. I'm also interested on the like blockchain side. I'm interested in like some of the identity stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like um, what's like the Ethereum one called? They have like a naming system. 
Um, so the people like when you identify, you can like pseudo anonymous anonymously say like, this is my one account and everyone knows it's my account. Um, right. Kind of keep. Well, we do that know. now with, um, with uh, you know, SSH keys and in, in our, our public private keys that we use to connect to GitHub and servers and all that type of stuff. What they're doing yeah. is they're, they're trying to bring that out. And, and frankly, the thing that it has to be done the most in um, is uh, identification, right? If you can yeah. create a, a non-tamperable source of identification that comes from a trusted source, that is kind of the holy grail right now because we all use our social security number, which is nine digits. Yeah, it's not that like hard phone, now. You know, SMS yeah, two factor on your phone and stuff. Yep, you can you can uh, better than nothing, but it's, there's, and, there's yeah, yeah. And so the idea of a nine digit number controlling your entire financial uh, life, <laughs> nine digits, a, a computer. I mean, my iPhone can go through every single. Just, yeah. um, Social security number within a, a few seconds, probably. Like it doesn't take that yeah. long to iterate through nine digits anymore, right? And so having yeah. these um, blockchain-based identities, those are good. Um, the problem is right now a lot of the the stuff that's happening in the crypto world is so shrouded in all of this like fog and you know other mm -hmm. folks who are just trying to make a, a quick buck. But there are groups out there that are um, are trying to create and base their new. Um, currencies, I, I fully see even fiat currencies moving to some sort of um, blockchain-based ledger behind it. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in the in the future, China's already starting to adopt that. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've also got um, uh, some countries around. I, I want to say Ukraine is doing it, um, where their national identity is going to be based on um, uh, you know encryption okay. keys like or a, a longer yeah a longer key. So. Um, trying to have something that's less hackable than a, a nine digit, you know, social security number. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I've been thinking like for like a membership site, um, even something like just proving you're a member of, of an organization mm -hmm. as like, you can just trust the organization. They have a database, but is, are there cases where like it's stronger to, you know, do that in the blockchain and public and stuff. And maybe there are kind of, certain kinds of organizations that that would be, um, you know, to be able to prove that you're a member of it without actually, you know, like uh, well, just yeah, relying on the organization itself. Like the, like it's kind of on a, yeah. Yeah. Going back to the American, you know, uh, pediatric association, right? Like if your yeah. membership in a group has real world implications of, I can prescribe medicine and do all these different things. Um, how's that being monitored? How's that being, you know, how are yeah. you creating a tamper-proof system around that? Um, and so being able to say, this is my ID number, this is who I am within this system, um, and then eventually tying it to your general ID, right? Um, yeah. I use Keybase, and I'm really bummed that, um, actually bummed that that Zoom bought them because I have a feeling like it's going to be going away here pretty soon. But they kind of had mm -hmm. that idea of create a central ID that you can then verify your Twitter you're verifying yourself. You don't have to wait on Twitter yeah. to verify it. You're saying, that's my Twitter account. That's my Facebook account. That's who I am here. And anything that you're wanting to send to me, I can then sign it and say that, yes, this is me. And so then you could do something like that where you have a central ID that you then say, okay, this membership site over here, yes, I'm approving that that um, that ID over there. And I'm signing that with my general, um, yeah. with my general identity. Um, yeah, I mean, and the, the fun thing about it is, that technology is all there. It's just a matter of somebody yeah. productizing yeah, it, and I think it simple enough to people, use. There's a lot of demos and a lot of cool stuff. And then there's all that snake oil you got to filter through. But like uh, over the next few years, people are going to start figuring out what the real use cases are for some of this new crypto stuff and yeah. putting it to use. And then that's the most exciting. And then it, it'll it'll happen. And then, you know, you and I will talk about it, but people won't won't really understand how it works underneath. Right. They'll just that, <laughs> well, hopefully I'll they don't feel that. Some stuff I don't even understand either. Like NFTs, don't get care. me started on them because I have no <laughs> idea what the hell those things are and why they even exist. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Next next episode. Um, so anyway, thanks for your time, man. Um, yeah, no worries. I appreciate. It. Was there anything else? Any final last words or ways that we can tell people to um, look out for you no. and your work? Or should they reach yeah, out? Yeah, I mean, uh, folks can find me online on Twitter, uh, Techner Teitzel, and um, check out Locker if they want to know more of what we're doing 
uh, to keep WordPress and other CMSs secure. But okay. um, no, I'm, I'm happy to have these conversations and I'm glad that you uh, invited me to be on. Yep, awesome. So it's Chris Teitzel, T-E-I-T-Z-E-L and Locker is lock R dot I. Yeah, we did the whole like, Web 2.0 thing to <laughs> drop the last E and try to be cool, just, right? Yeah. <laughs> it just means you've been around for a while. I feel like that's like cloud. Right. That's like a... <laughs> right. <laughs> like right. You probably incorporated in 2008, like we can tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a five, I've got a five did or five number uh, uh, URL. So it tells you how, uh, how long ago we, we yeah. registered that. <laughs> good, good, good job. All right, man. Thanks for your time. Yeah, no worries. Take care. You too.